Dr. Sabina Alkar is a professor of poverty and human development at Oxford University. She'll be presenting on poverty, me uh, poverty measurement. Uh, and she's also uh, a very important member of our board of ASAP. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Sabina, for joining us. Yeah, the floor is yours. So just to dive right, right in, um, in his last book published posthumously in 2019, um, Sir Tony Atkinson um, wrote a book on measuring poverty around the world. His first book had been six, 50 years earlier in 1969, his first book on poverty. And when he talked about academics who were studying poverty, he observed that there's something different when you are a statistician st studying poverty than when you are studying other kinds of statistics. Um, so learning about the extent of poverty is important, but it's the link with action that marks out this issue from other subjects of study. Poverty statistics matter because they motivate people to tackle a key challenge. And if you haven't read this book, I would recommend you doing so because he describes prime ministers who took a paperback on the beach on vacation and came back with an idea and acted on it to address poverty. Um, politicians who had a meaningful exchange with an individual and it changed what they did. And if we're gonna be both academics and standing against poverty, we have to think not only about the content, but also about the messaging, the interactions, the ways of, of addressing um, those who can do what we cannot in terms of linking uh, work and research on poverty to action. And a lot of people in ASAP's conference on structural change, of course, are from many of those different agencies, um, from grassroots and community level um, to movements and, and different types of change. But I think it's, it's just always something when you are trying to focus on tenure, on publishing your paper, on you know getting a profile of your research that you have to keep in the other part of your mind the need to actually link the research to action. Why do I think poverty measurement still has um, quite a priority um, if we're standing against poverty? Isn't it a, a subject that's old fashioned? It uses household surveys and not digital technologies that you can update in real time with big data. Um, it's uh, often done by statistics offices, which are not thought it to be at the cutting edge of the data and innovation sciences. Um, but in a sense, what Atkinson articulated in this book is that it is an accountability tool. If you make a commitment to stand against poverty and you don't measure it, and you're not able to document what you've done, the political commitment, what he writes, is has no force. And so measurement is able to monitor that. This week in OFI, our research center, um, we launched a book published by Oxford University Press, but the author of the book was the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Juan Manuel Santos. And his first book about his work for which he was awarded the Peace Prize was the battle against um, a war, the, the battle for peace in Colombia. And the second book was the battle against poverty. And so he describes of how he made a political commitment in 2010 when he was elected to office. And then by 2018, he could, using the statistics of monetary and multidimensional poverty, demonstrate that he had cut, for example, multidimensional poverty by a third. And so I think we have to recognize, and you're not taught this in graduate school, if you're an economist, but that there's a political reading of numbers that can cut for good or for ill. But to understand that and to try to make sure that it's, the numbers are good and it's worked as a positive incentive to recognize change and not something that's manipulated. In a different way, but I think related, is that if you go into management, then key performance indicators, performance monitoring, all of this becomes part of the lingo, um, a very popular part. And um, James Foster, my co-author in the methodology, speaks of measurement as leadership and also of statistics as a performance indicator or performance monitoring is the language that Tony Atkinson used. And the reason that that can be positive is that it's good for civil servants, 
to be recognized and to be promoted if they are successful. And it's also good for subnational as well as national actors. The first country to launch an official multidimensional poverty measure was Mexico way back in 2009. And it's still in force with the Obrador government in 2023. Um, and an interesting and unforeseen impact in Mexico was that governors couldn't be reelected unless they had reduced poverty. And so a couple of years after the MPI, the Multidimensional Poverty Index was launched in Mexico, the governors were making their way to Coneval, the institute charged with measuring and evaluating poverty reduction to say, what do I have to do so that I reduce poverty before elections? You don't want manipulation, but you do want to unlock this genuine concern of what are the actions that will actually make a difference. Um, and so that's again, why we have to think about measurement. And in that relationship, we often think of measurement as statistics offices, maybe political leaders and policies. But it's interesting coming back to President Santos's book, um, he involved McKinsey, he involved the Blair Deliverology Unit. And so there was a group of management consultants who then took measures of poverty, put them into their flow diagrams, used them as KPIs, key performance indicators, used them, and they were regularly updated in Colombia every year with administrative data in between times to try to track changes. And so if you can measure and manage and you bring that field together, it's another effective way of standing against poverty, but using different tools um, synergistically. So I, before I sort of introduce what multidimensional poverty measurement might be, um, I know we have different views of the SDGs um, and they're too many and they're too complex and they're not happening, whatever. But there were some interesting measurement insights um, when they were launched. And they certainly feed into a multidimensional approach to measuring phenomena of a counting-based type. One is that it's recognized that even if dashboards are popular, lives are not dashboards. We are interlinked. So it's the same person who wakes up who has a malnourished child, who wakes up because the house leaks during the rain, who wakes up without a job or job security, who wakes up um, and needing other kids to get ready for school or whatever. And so recognizing the interlinkages at the level of the person or household, which is what a multidimensional poverty measure does, or at other levels is quite important. And in a related way, um, recognizing that it can be cheaper, because we all need cheap uh, avenues for, for change, to reduce interconnected deprivations together. This had come out in, in the Millennium Development Goals at Studies of Effective Progress, published as early as 2008. Um, but the key terms are actually backed up in the data. So um, I'll show you a slide of, of how people are poor, their particular deprivation profiles. But what you need to know is 80% of people who are multidimensionally poor have five or more deprivations happening to them at the same time. And so if they have to run around to five different agencies in order to solve problems, um, it's very inefficient for them and it probably won't happen. And so integrated policies can be uh, useful from the bottom up from the perspective of the protagonists, the men, women and children who are impoverished as well as from those who are trying to have cost-effective policies. And then even among the poor, it can be easiest to focus on those that are just barely poor. And I think there's a good call in the SDGs to see if the poorest groups, the poorest regions, if it's children, if it's a subnational region, if it's the elderly, if it's particular ethnic groups, indigenous groups, that their poverty reduction is actually happening faster than the poverty reduction of less poor groups. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a positive way from India. So when I read the preamble um, to, uh, of the sustainable development goals from a measurement lens as an academic, then you can pull out some of these and think about, well, what implications does that have when we come to measure poverty in all its forms? So um, the measurement approach that we primarily use, though at the end of this, I'll share some research horizons, is bringing together counting approaches and axiomatic approaches. And this was a, a, a union that Tony 
Atkinson had suggested back in 2003 and that a wonderful academic Jayaraj in India helped me to get my mind around. And James Foster uh, built on the foster Greer thorbeck Index that he had done in the axiomatic tradition, bringing it together with the counting tradition to do multidimensional poverty measures. And the key insight is what I've already said. You're looking around the rooms of the protagonists um, and they are saying, these are the different deprivations we are facing at the same time. And trying to uh, count or look at some weighted sum, not just of one deprivation at a time, but a nexus of different ones. If you're empirically in minded, it usually uses a household survey. NGOs use um, ad hoc surveys. Uh, if you're targeting, you use registry data. Many countries now put this in their census. Um, but uh, the key is that it, all of the information has to be present for each person or each household. And you can either do individual or household measures. Um, and I won't have time, unfortunately, to share how countries like Colombia or Costa Rica, um, India or Nigeria, um, South Africa, Armenia are using multidimensional poverty indices for policy. Um, but we have a South-South network with 62 countries where what they do is they share what's worked and what hasn't worked um, to try to figure out how to support each other um, simply to focus on poverty. There's so many agendas out, but, but focusing on this one. Um, so uh, what I will do is just share a bit first about how to measure, about some global results and some research horizons. And I'll keep that to 15, 18 minutes. In terms of how to measure, so whether it's for an academic paper um, or for an NGO product in a community or for a global measure, you need to figure out what you want to measure or what the protagonists want to measure. So you need to identify together um, the dimensions and the indicators that comprise poverty in that region. The same technique can be used for well-being as it is in Bhutan. It's been used for women's empowerment as it is by uh, Feed the Future. It can be used for other phenomena like fuel, time use, um, et cetera. But I'm gonna describe it as a, as a structure for poverty. So dimensions are just conceptual, they're not in your data set, but each indicator is present in your data. And for each indicator, you set a condition of what does it mean to be deprived or non-deprived. In nutrition, usually it's a body mass index of 18.5 for people aged 20 and above or two standard deviations um, for weight, a stunting or underweight for children under five. Um, for child mortality, for example, it could be if any child has died in the last five years. For years of schooling, if nobody in the household has six years of schooling is what's used in the global MPI, but it could be 10 years, it could be gendered. You need one female and one male as they do in Pakistan, or you could have gendered schooling indicators as Afghanistan before this current government did. And school attendance um, are all children in school up to the age at which they should complete a certain class, eight or 10 or beyond. And then some living standard indicators, in this case, do you cook with solid fuel? Do you have adequate sanitation that's not shared? Do you have drinking water within a 30 minutes walk? Do you have electricity? Um, are your roof wall and floor materials uh, durable? And do you have more than one of a set of small assets, radio, television, telephone, animal cart, computer, refrigerator, um, bicycle, motorcycle? And if you have a car or truck, you're not deprived in assets. But other countries add employment, they add violence, they add social protection, they add child and youth conditions, um, they add uh, social capital. So these are flexible but you need to select what poverty means to a particular person, because it can be individual or household. And once you've done that for each person, you look and see if they are deprived or non-deprived in each of the indicators. And in this case, the indicators weight is the fatness of their block. So you can see that nutrition and the three living standard indicators together make up a weight of a third plus two more um, so this person is deprived in 44% of the weighted indicators. So are they poor? We all know that poverty lines are in a philosophical sense, arbitrary. 
Um, we apply multiple ones, we test them for robustness. Um, and in the global MPI, we publish a number of different poverty lines, 1%, 20%, 30%, 33%, 40%, 50%, 70%. Um, but the main one that's used by UNDP is 33%. So in that case, a person deprived in 44% is identified as poor. And the measure then can say, well, what percentage of the people in your country or in your group are poor? And that's the incidence, the prevalence, what journalists understand. But the next very important topic is how poor are they? What's the average score among the poor of the percentage of deprivations they face? This person, Deepa, is 44%. But if it was 90%, it would be worse. It would mean she was carrying more deprivations at the same time. And very simply, when you multiply these two together, you obtain a index. That's a, a number that shows the percentage of possible deprivations that person explains, experiences. But the value is that you can break it down by each indicator. And that's what makes it useful for policy, for actors, for NGOs, for um, private sector groups, because they can see exactly what they have to change to bring down poverty. And the insight, if you look at the right-hand side, the national, the urban, and the rural, and the rural is the tallest, each colored bar is an indicator. And the weighted contribution of each bar to poverty is its block. And if you take out any deprivation, of any poor person, then poverty comes down. You get it? So the height of the whole bar will come down if one poor person who was undernourished becomes well-nourished. And that is, in a sense, the link to performance monitoring, the link to um, accountability, uh, and also to being able to reward good performance in poverty, is being able to link different actions to outcomes in, in quite a direct way. I would, don't have time to go into why the head counter, the incidence doesn't capture it, but we publish papers showing that it does not um, in a number of countries. So I'm just gonna whiz through a bit of a briefing on the global multidimensional poverty index. Um, and when I do that, think of yourself as standing against poverty, where poverty is not just money, but it's these 10 indicators. And your question is, you know, I have a limited amount of resources. How do I roll policy actions to try to affect most of these indicators at the same time? And of course, it'll vary depending on the shape of deprivations you're working on. And basically, I'm drawing from the current uh, Global Multidimensional Poverty Index that we co-release with UNDP each year. And um, the data uses demographic and health surveys for um, around 95 countries, 98 countries, and national surveys for 13. We cover 110 countries, 6.1 billion people um, from 2011 to 2022. Um, and so of those 6.1 billion, very sadly, 1.1 billion are poor because they are deprived in more than one third of those 10 indicators weighted that we went through. Remember, nutrition, child mortality, years of schooling, et cetera. So that's 18% of people living in the developing world. And we cover 92% of the population of the developing world. And of that 1.1 billion, half, 566 million, haven't yet celebrated their 18th birthday. Um, so their children in the UNICEF sense. Again, making very visible the need to look at the youngest. You might think they live primarily in low-income countries, but two-thirds of them, 730 million, live in middle-income countries. Um, so it's not a surprise because there, there are more middle-income countries these days, but it does mean that um, just getting into a middle-income status doesn't solve very acute nexuses of deprivations. And geographically, um, 85% of poor people live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, um, with now slightly more appearing to live in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also the data in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are on average two and a half years older 
than the data in South Asia. So um, I'll come back to data, but all of the numbers are a little bit precarious because people are not investing in poverty data. If you look at the deprivations most common, they're on the right. Deprivations in cooking fuel strike nearly a billion people, housing 881 million, 824 sanitation, nutrition 600 million, electricity and years of schooling. So half of the poor people can't turn on the light when darkness falls, there's no electricity. Um, more than half have somebody in their house who's undernourished. And it's not that everybody who's undernourished is captured or everybody with electricity is captured, only people who are also deprived in other things. Um, so basically about one quarter of the people without electricity are not multidimensionally poor. Um, but in the case of nutrition, um, it, years of schooling, it's, it's very different. Um, also what you see is nutrition is much more of a problem in the red bar, which is South Asia. And, and this multidimensional poverty indices is different than monetary. The height of the bar is the percentage of people who are multidimensionally poor, and the black dot is monetary poverty. And you see there are a lot of black dots in the, in the low red bits. Um, so monetary poverty tends to be quite a bit lower, although in some countries um, it's, it's, it's considerably higher. And so we, need, we, we describe them as two eyes, and having two eyes, you see poverty better in three dimensions than if you just looked at one aspect or the other. Um, this year we focused on why you go beyond just the percentage of people who's poor. And the basic answer is that, um, although it varies a little bit across regions, the poorest region in terms of the percentage of people is on the right-hand side. So Niger, Chad, Central Africa Republic. The region where each poor person in that country has the highest intensity of poverty, the biggest deprivation score, are the highest up. So you see that in Niger, not only is the greatest percentage of people poor at around 90%, but each poor person is deprived in 64% of the weighted indicators. And that's the case nationally, it's the case subnationally. We have disaggregated data for 1,281 regions. Obviously the curve is steepest in Sub-Saharan Africa, the orange on the left bottom, um, and less steep in East Asian Pacific, where even in Papua New Guinea, you have high levels, incidence of poverty, but lower intensity. Um, and it just brings me to a last observation, which is that the MPI is highly disaggregated, but for every disaggregated unit, you have this indicator information, which is what actually gets people excited um, in the global MPI, but also in bespoke national MPIs. So I want to move towards the end just by saying there's some good news. Um, 25 countries out of the 81 for whom we have comparable data that we launched with UNDP cut their poverty by half. Um, and I'll just give an example of Cambodia and India. So Cambodia in seven and a half years cut it by more than half. Um, incidents fell from 37% to 17%. The number of poor fell by half, 2.8 million. And children who were the poorest had the fastest reduction. But this is slightly post-pandemic. Deprivations in school attendance increased. Um, but interestingly, the increases were mainly among the non-poor. So there may have been some positive um, effects on the poor from some of the social protection. Moving to India, um, in 15 years, from 2005-06 to 2019-21, 415 million people exited multidimensional poverty. There are 445 million people in Europe. So it's a change of global proportions and it's quite pro-poor. So in the bottom, the blue-green thing, um, are the states of India and the poorest state, um, Bihar on the bottom right, was the one that had the fastest reduction. So the level of poverty is horizontal with the poorest on the right, and that it's a run to zero poverty. The ones closest to the bottom of the slide have the fastest reduction. And so in terms of the SDG goal of leaving no one behind, Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, um, Chhattisgarh, um, were the poorest and had the fastest reduction. So it's a catch up. And that also pertains to children, where children were the poorest and had the fastest reduction. 
um, overall and also in each indicator. So um, closing with data and research, the global MPI um, uses the most recent household surveys. Our poorest country is Niger um, and its data are from 2012. We had to drop two countries this year, Burkina Faso and South Sudan. Why? Their data were from 2010. Sometime you should go to the Forbes website, Forbes Billionaires, real time. You have updated data on billionaires every one hour. So it seems quite absurd that we can't have more up-to-date data. There was a call when the SDGs were fashioned for a data revolution. That data revolution is leaving poverty data behind. And whether it was Atkinson Commission to the World Bank um, or other um, serious academics, they have called for a significant investment in poverty data. We haven't seen that yet, and we still need to call for it because without up-to-date data, how can we hold people accountable? How can we celebrate good performance and pinpoint bad performance? Um, how can we measure to manage uh, and know exactly how to use resources most effectively? You do it by whatever information the actors have, NGO, state, private sector, uh, mixed uh, groups, but it would clearly be better if the data were more up to date. Finally, um, just some headlines of research in case people on the call are interested. Our big focus this year is gender and children, and we'll be launching a report um, at the Commission on Women. But uh, a couple of years ago, we just did the headline and we found that of the people who were poor um, in 2021, two thirds of them, 836 million, did not have any girl, any woman in the household who had completed six years of schooling. And every girl, every household had a girl or woman who should have completed six years of schooling. Um, and so this is at a global scale. We talk about the importance of girls' education. Every regression analysis shows it's important. It's a determinant of other kinds of positive change. But when we actually measure the raw numbers, uh, we find serious gaps. So we're going into those, going into undernutrition for children, out of school, looking at gender disparities, intra-household patterns, um, where the same children in a, in a household are going to school or not, undernourished or not. Um, so that's one research area. Um, another is um, going beyond an acute poverty measure to look at moderate poverty for middle-income countries, um, quite in demand. Another is merging um, the MPI data with geospatially with other environmental problems that strike the same people at the same time, like forest loss, air precipitates, cyclones, fires, earthquakes, done trials in Madagascar, looking further into that. Um, and another is well-being. So poverty is important, but so is well-being that includes mental health and relationships, culture and environment, time use and governance and um, psychological well-being and spirituality. So Bhutan's measure uses the same methodology on a well-being measure. Um, and we're learning a lot from ongoing exchanges. So for those of you who are geeks, we now have Stata programs in the Stata toolbox. And for those of you who like working really empirically, we have now very large data sets also looking at the composition of poverty and the need for um, multi-sectoral responses because the common, most common indicators, as I mentioned in India and in the world, per pertain to nutrition and housing, sanitation, and cooking fuel. So I think I'll stop there, uh, leaving time for exchange. I've tried to simply say, as an academic, but also an activist, following Tony Atkinson, people who work on measurement should think about the paperbacks presidents read, even if we will never write a paperback ourselves, think about how to reach out to those who can do what we cannot, especially to the protagonists, um, and then also how we can try to cast measures and metrics, even if they're academically rigorous, as somehow useful to people who are managers, people who are political leaders, policy technical types, et cetera. I haven't had time to talk about targeting and budget and coordination, but we can do that in discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Alkair. That was a great presentation. Um, 
if, uh, if anyone has questions, we can use the raise hand uh, function uh, to start that. Um, but I'll start us off um, by just asking, uh, have you identified any um, international economic policies that like sign significantly affect poverty? Because coming from the U.S., uh, you, I always hear about, you know, these big companies outsourcing cheap labor to the global south, um, which are creating, you know, conditions of poverty. Um, and some may say that that this sort of labor is, you know, like, quote unquote, like an average pay, you know, in that country. Um, how does this affect uh, global poverty? Is there a global relation between countries that are more wealthy and that are less wealthy? And how, how does that, how do you address issues that go beyond, you know, the national borders? Yes, so um, the global MPI I presented very sadly can't include employment. We're rattling the doors of the data providers to try to get a couple questions in so we could. Um, but every MPI except Mexico is in Latin America, and a number of them in other countries like Nigeria and South Africa have employment in them. They have unemployment, they have informal work, dependency ratios, not in education, um, employment or training for youth. And um, in a couple countries, um, we've been able to get something about pay and, and living wage kind of details. And so that, first of all, it signals the importance it has in those countries. And second, if you look at the trends, the one that's very hard to tackle is the informal work. And yes, there are a couple consultants, but informal informality and the lack of really good labor conditions is something that has not come down mm. in many of the Latin American countries. We now have countries, you know, with a, a number of, of years over a decade of, of using multidimensional indices. And so we can see where, where things keep getting stuck. And formality is, is certainly one of them. Uh, I would also say that one of the big gaps, in my view, of the data collection is unsafe work, um, either because of discrimination or bullying or because it's too hot, you crouch, you have an accident and you're not insured. Um, but unsafe work is, um, it, it also, if you look at global burden of disease, it's also a cause of death. And so it's, it's quite a considerable concern that's overlooked in many of the metrics and including in household surveys. So we're having a poverty data conference in February to try to you know, shake the trees with some people to say, look, these are, they come up when we talk in communities, but they're still not in the global data structures that we have. And so how do we, how do we change them? We tried in 2009, we tried in 2014, we failed twice, we're trying again, yeah. we'll see. And why do you think there's a difficulty um, like I guess mobilizing people to like collect this 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 data on poverty, like you mentioned, the Forbes updates every hour, but we have yet to see this like really great transformation of of poverty on data. Um, well, why is that? I think there are three things. One is simply lack of understanding. So if you ask um, even a wonderful educated person what they think, they think it's very expensive. I don't know if you've done consumption poverty work, but a consumption survey has, you know, 450 questions in Malaysia up to 110, 1,010, 100 questions. So it has lots of questions. If you look at the national MPIs around the world, they have between 32 and 77 questions. Costa Rica uses 77, it's the most. If you look at the global MPI, we are in surveys that have roughly, um, 900, the, the least number of questions actually is Nepal. We were talking about Nepal a bit, um, uh, which is about 860 questions. We use 43 questions, 43, 5% of the questions of the survey. And mm. so this could go viral. It could have other problem uh, ways of gathering the data. Um, but I think um, there's a lack of understanding of what that is. And there's a lack of engagement, whether it's the SWIFT surveys of the World Bank or even non non you know, citizen data. Um, I think it, there needs to be more conversations, which is what we're trying to open, but I don't know if we'll, it'll be successful, but we're trying. And um, because I think that's the big reason is people don't know that actually there are lots of really, really, really hard problems. This isn't a hard problem. It just needs a couple people to put their minds to it and some resources and actually a breakthrough could be made. Mm -hmm. The second reason um, is of course, during the pandemic, there were lots of cuts that, 
countries have not, in a sense, recovered from in terms of the statistical offices. And the third is that there is an active push against household surveys by the big data people. Um, this global forum on sustainable data, whatever. They say household surveys are old fashioned and they should be discontinued. And we should do cell phone data and we should do satellite data. And we do, you know, if we, we, we merge, we overlook, but it doesn't go inside the house. It doesn't tell us if there's an undernourished child. It doesn't tell us if they live with an illiterate mother. It doesn't tell us, you know, some things that you can actually only gather in most statistical systems still from household surveys. So I asked some of these people who were saying, we're, we're barking up the wrong tree. I said, well, what country in the world could make uh, an update every year, a multidimensional poverty index from other data, registry data, administrative data, um, satellite data? And the answer was maybe Denmark. That's not good enough. <laughs> so I think, you know, we need to, at the same time, explore the new, very popular things, um, both with AI and with digital, digital technologies and things. But it, at the moment, we still need the bedrock of information door to door and talking to people and trying to support them to be honest in their responses. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Yeah, I wanted to go in the similar direction from Sebastian and uh, explore a little bit more the political dimension of it all, because this conference is kind of on structural change and how to achieve, achieve it in politics. And so if I look at the project, uh, sort of, I see four different components of it. You have within the social sciences, you are uh, drawing attention to poverty in particular as one of the things that we uh, should look at more. And you are also looking at it differently in a way that potentially is more efficient in that if we moved your indicators, we would do more for the poor than if we move other indicators that may have been traditionally deployed, let's say the human development report or even simpler and more primitive measures. And then secondly, uh, outside the social sciences, we talk about governments, right? So if governments took these indicators more seriously and really aligned their policies with a deliberate attempt to improve their standing according to the multi-dimensional poverty index, they would do better by the poor than they are doing if they used other measures. And so uh, since these, uh, you know, uh, they would do better in terms of, uh, they would do more about poverty and they would also do, uh, spend their resources more effectively again on promoting poverty eradication. So uh, given that these uh, sort of changes that would happen if your index were widely accepted or the more widely accepted it is, are political changes, are changes that have impact in the real world, how money is being spent and so on, you would expect some people to be happy about them and to support them uh, and other people to be uh, unhappy about them and uh, to oppose them. And so what I wondered whether you can reflect on a little bit more is, uh, have you encountered political opposition and how have you responded to that opposition? And uh, it, it, has it worked to respond by saying, this is just a better measure or is it sometimes uh, necessary to kind of engage really politically and try to, in, you know, st strategically overcome political resistance to the adoption of these measures and to making them policy relevant? No, those are great questions, Thomas. Um, and I think we can all think about them. And I should say, if anyone on this call has better ideas, please just pop in um, and, and offer them. It, in terms of the governments, so um, I mentioned we now coordinate conversations between 62 governments and 20 international agencies and 40 of those governments have official statistics. And they vary from ones that launched a long time ago, Mexico, Bhutan, Colombia, Chile, to recent ones, India, Namibia, um, eh, Mauritania, Samoa, um, Uganda launched this year, I think. Um, and it's a, a Nigeria updated, but a significant update down to the senatorial district. And so yes, it's controversial. 
um, and some states like in Nigeria, um, of course, Sokoto and you know the north of Nigeria, you would expect to be poorest, but you didn't expect Bayelsa and Plateau um, because of the conflicts, because violence is in Nigeria's MPI. Um, they, they were highlighted. And so that created some shockwaves and then the governors engaged and, and looked at it. And, and so I think it, it can be a tool of, of communication. Mm -hmm. um, it can also um, be something that they don't like. So we've had a, a few governments try to stop reporting when there was a, a acrimonious election and the previous government had been successful. And then the new government came in and said, we wanna stop this, that's their baby. We don't want it. Um, and in those governments, thankfully, they had legalized it. So they'd made it legally required to report it. And I really recommend that now to institutionalize it so that instead of a government deciding whether to measure poverty or not, they have to. And they're, the question is how they're going to reduce it, not whether they're going to measure it. And so that's a, a push that we have, um, particularly when after tra electoral transitions, you know, people try to undo everything um, and, and start anew. I think another um, way that we've done is to try, when we can, bring out positive elections or findings. So in Bangladesh, um, which has not yet launched their MPI, um, but by the global MPI, Silhat was the poorest. And there was a shock because Silhat has lots of mining, zero monetary poverty. But it made sense um, because they don't have infrastructure. They don't have services. And so there was a kind of a, um, a legitimacy because they could see that they knew that Silhad was poor, but that the monetary wasn't capturing it. And then they had the fastest reduction um, of poverty in the period from 2015 to 2019, according to the DHS data in Bangladesh. And so that I think is, is interesting. And we could say that of Gaza, we could say that of Bihar, we could say that in Cambodia. Um, and that's leading with the positive or Oaxaca state in, in, in Mexico, um, leading with positive examples of, of change and then letting the negative figure it out themselves and try to do better next time. I think that's been more of a strategy that we have. Um, but yes, there, there's controversy. There's people who don't like it when the numbers go up. And that's one requirement we have to work with the government is that they will release numbers that are bad for them. If poverty goes up, they, you know, it has to be recognized. And mm -hmm. we have had some that went up. Colombia's went up by 0.6% during the pandemic, for example. Um, and so it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I think other people will have better suggestions. And then in terms of within the social sciences, I guess what we feel is that um, there's so much money on cash transfers, and yet it often just creates a kind of dependency that's hard to break. You're paying people to go up across the poverty line, but you're not changing their lives and livelihoods necessarily, depending, of course, each country is different and how the conditionalities of that cash transfer are. Um, but hopefully investing in nutrition and um, uh, health care, um, uh, education and uh, services, that that could be a bit of a win-win. And I think the example that we'll give, because it's well-documented, again, the older examples are well-documented, is in Costa Rica during President Solis's government, um, they changed and he did a presidential decree to change the budget allocation formula to reflect their uh, the level and the composition of poverty and they changed and they were in austerity so they couldn't increase their budget but um, the slope of reduction of poverty was visibly accelerated and that um, carried over for three years after that and so there are these examples which um, now new countries are adopting and using but um, we, we need to have time to study them properly and document them properly. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to hear more about, I don't think you had enough time to get into get into it during your presentation, but the solutions that, as you were just saying, Colombia and Costa Rica were able to um, utilize just to reduce poverty, like what did that look like there? And uh, what about that can we use to apply elsewhere? Um, it's very good and I, I would recommend the battle against poverty. Um, because basically it goes blow by blow. So in Colombia, one problem was coordination. So, you know, the ministers, they're really important people and they like to compete and get more money and get more prestige. Um, and so Santos realized that, you know, he had a goal, which was to reduce poverty because uh, he realized he couldn't stop the war without working on that. Um, so he set up a round table, he chaired it personally 
nine ministries were involved. They couldn't send delegates. The ministers had to be there. He worked with um, Mackenzie and with Deliverology um, in Blair's government to set up a management structure. And one meeting a year, they would uh, they, they set targets each year for each of the 15 indicators in their multidimensional poverty index and just a red, yellow, green stoplight system. And then they would project it up each year of which indicators were on track, green, slow, yellow, or stopped red. And as he describes it in the book, there was this nervous silence as people looked at those results. And then he would go through and say, well, why is this indicator not on track? And they kept some unallocated money. And so each year when they saw the indicators that were stalled, then they did some acceleration program, but they did it together as a group of ministers. And so the idea was to try to, you know, to say poverty is too important for ego. It's a team sport. We have to fight together. We have to play together and we have to play to win. And so that created a different mentality. Um, it required a kind of exertion of authority. He had majority in, in legislature, you know, and so you need a, a critical mass of political power to sometimes be able to use the, that authority. Another thing is that he created a new ministry, the DPS Departamento of Department of Social Prosperity, to coordinate the house to house um, activities and to resource them and to create a coordination system, not only at the national level, but in the provinces and the municipalities. And they used the census and they did an MPI with the census. And so there was data available, which they also used during the pandemic. Um, so there's a chapter on that. Another chapter is on all the policies they did. Um, so childhood and youth are one of their five dimensions and early childhood education wasn't free. And they knew from Jim Hepkin's work that it's a vital time in a child's life. And they knew from the MPI that it wasn't going well. And so they brought together and they, they did sort of free early child education. And that was an investment one year. Um, another was housing. And um, there, the urban, the housing minister had a wonderful urban housing program, but the numbers showed that the deficits were in rural areas. And so again, it was a little bit political hardball to say, no, nope, you can't do that. Uh, it's gotta be built in rural areas. Um, then another part of Colombia was the peace process and the victims. And so uh, one chapter is on how victims of violence, 9 million, um, both of FARC and of government violence were identified and then prioritized. And so that part of the, the victimization programs were focused on the dimensions of the MPI. And then in the Havana Peace Accord, there were three major MPI related requirements, one for rural development, one identifying some of the FARC um, affected areas and the poorest villages where within two years there had to be a visible reduction of multidimensional poverty. Um, and a third was basically reintegration of the ex-combatants. Uh, so I think these are the kind of detailed, of course it's different in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica they had lots of duplication of social programs because they had too many and they had identified duplication, cut them and then use that money for something else. But everybody gets annoyed if you cut their programs. So again, there's a different kind of political framework um, that you needed to, to navigate in order to get through, uh, you know, guillotine as it were, duplication to get through to something else. So um, uh, I'm, we are about to publish with UNDP um, sort of at the story level, lots of interviews of actors on what they've done in their countries, but we're a tiny research group underfunded. And so we have all the relationships, but we don't have the time uh, to do all of the in-depth studies. But yeah, with 40 countries active, um, it, we, we know what stories need documentation, pulling out the actual uh, policy documents, the speeches, the statistics, verifying that what they say is actually true. Um, interviewing local actors in Bhutan, for example, Tariana Foundation, an NGO is the one that actually identified the households, had their MPI, had their picture, uh, went in the communities and worked with them uh, at a house, house to house, door to door kind of uh, poverty reduction activity. So yeah, there, there's work to be done that's not done yet, but those are a few of the overall tactics. Thank you.